Hi, everyone. My name is Kirk Bachman, and welcome back to The Ultimate Dish. Today, I'm thrilled to introduce our guest, Wanda Grobelar, a chef and an expert in soft skills, leadership, quality assurance, and management training. Wanda is also a PhD candidate researching how to navigate stress in the kitchen. As the head of quality assurance at the Culinary Arts Center of Azerbaijan in Baku, Wanda brings a wealth of experience in creating lean cultures, a topic we'll be delving into today. Currently pursuing a Doctor of Business Administration, Wanda's research focuses on the intersection of workplace psychology and robotics. In addition to this, Wanda has authored several articles and studies covering topics such as creating quality cultures in higher education, guiding culinarians in burnout prevention, and exploring Industry 4.0 for future jobs in the culinary sector. Her unwavering commitment to driving positive change and helping chefs navigate kitchen dynamics while maintaining their well-being is truly inspiring. Join us today as we explore the realms of leadership, technology, and the future of workplace psychology with the remarkable Wanda Grobelar. And there she is. Good good evening, I have to say. Good evening. Thank you so much for joining <laughs> um us. Um, thank you for this opportunity afforded to me. Um, it's really, I'm really grateful for this and um, to share my experience with more people, especially more chefs around the world. So thank you. Beautiful. Ab absolutely be beautifully said. And, and, and I hinted a little bit uh, at the intro, uh, Wanda, uh, you're, you're several hours ahead of me uh, here in Boulder, Colorado, <laughs> where it's 9, 15 a.m. and and Noel, our producer, at, who's in San Diego, um, so I'm super, super appreciative of your of your late into the evening time that you're dedicating to us, and 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 to to kick things off right off the bat, out of curiosity, because um, this is this is really all about you. What brought you to Baku? Um, absolutely beautiful part of the world, right? I think I read some somewhere once that. The entire country is below sea level. I don't know how that works, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> but but what brought you uh, to that part of the world? Um, it's a long and a short story, but um, to explain to you, um, many many years ago, I was um, living in South Africa. I was born in South Africa, and I always had a passion to leave South Africa because I'm curious. Um, I need to know what's happened in the world. And I enjoyed dealing with different cultures, different people, and I wanted to know more. And at that stage, I was not really qualified um, in something. And I thought um, that I, my passion was also to be a chef. So I thought if I maybe pursue this career, I know that it will take me out of the country. It will create more opportunities. And the way how I exit was actually, I entered the FHA Cup in Singapore and um, a wedding cake and to the dessert table. And um, I made Singapore Airlines flew almost 200 kg of my equipment um, to Singapore. And um, I entered the competition. I managed to win a bronze medal in the competition. Oh, wow. <laughs> um, which opened doors for me from there. It started to open doors. So it was really to get a passport to leave South Africa um, because I was not um, very young at this stage. I was not like in my 20s. So I needed to find a way to leave. And that was my passport out of the country. And a good plan. And, then, <laughs> <laughs> and from there, I was living in um, the UAE for almost 10 years, um, where I started my academic career. I was always interested. I have a few uh, passions in life. Um, definitely chef is one of my passions. But I'm also interested in academics, research, to improve life for people. Um, I'm always curious. Um, I I want to know more what's happening. And I managed to find a pathway where I could have combined everything together. And I I used it. I studied first as MBA and then I started my PhD. And about two years ago, last year sometime, we came to Bok on holiday. And I fell in love with the country because um, it was different than the UAE um, for a change um, in many um, options. I will explain now to when we talk about the culinary scene in this country. And also, like you said, it's a very beautiful city. Um, it reminds you of Europe. My heart is always for Europe because um, my background is Dutch. And um, 
it reminded me of Europe. And that was, I got an opportunity here from a university um, as a lecturer, um, eventually quality assurance. And I decided to come to this country and explore because, uh, like I said, I'm always curious, want to learn about different cultures. And here I am. At the moment, here I am in Baku. So. No, I love it. You've said the word curious several times, and it, it's it's ironic or or even serendipitous that um, for us as an educational institution of higher education, it's it's sort of been a theme this year to stay curious um, or a cliche, if you will, um, because so much is changing around us, and we'll talk about that uh, a little bit. E even the simplest notion of how do we how do we celebrate AI and, and leverage it in a very, very positive way? There are all, always going to be some that immediately panic, right? You know, students are going to submit work that, you know, that has been helped <laughs> uh, by <laughs> technology. But if we do it in the right way and we stay curious, the results can be very beneficial and positive for everyone. So be before we dive into that, and I'd love to talk a little bit about your journey from pastry chef to uh, academics. But can you talk a little bit about the culinary scene in Baku, where you are now? Okay, so um, the culinary scene, I'm working currently for um, Casa Azerbaijan, as you know. And um, I, I first joined the university for the one-year contract there. I didn't know about Casa because Baku was very really, unfair. Azerbaijan, I didn't know about. Um, as even today, if you speak to people, you tell them you live in Azerbaijan, they think it's part of Turkey. Um, they ask you, where is it? They don't know where it's Azerbaijan. And so I didn't know there was a culinary school. Now, I know about individual people, but I didn't know about the school. And when I joined the school, he was telling me the story that when he joined many years ago in this country, um, which I similarly experienced, he realized that um, although this very good cuisine in this country, interesting cuisine, um, there's a lack in professional skills in this country. Because remember, in this country, um, the, 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 the young people get training from their mothers, their grandmothers, it's tradition coming through villages. There was not really the professional skills, you know, there was not a school to help them with this. And that was his vision, and he started the culinary school. Um, what's very interesting about this country is we have more than 4,200 villages. And very recently, I was talking to a government official because sometimes I also help the government with quality assurance in higher education. Sure. And he was telling me that he's collecting at the moment, um, you know, all the traditional recipes from families in these villages. And one particular recipe he mentioned to me, what was really interesting, that is a recipe where they cook food, a type of meat, but they use a nail, a rusted nail. They throw that into the food to improve the color of the food. And um, this is the tradition of this village. <laughs> so if you think about iron oxidite um, and what's happening in your body, but this is the tradition. So it's actually fascinating to understand all the traditions. And it is completely different. And um, like my husband, he loves milk, fresh milk. We come from countries where fresh milk was freely available. It's much more difficult to get it here. You cannot really go just to the supermarket and buy a bottle of milk. Everything is processed. Salted butter. A problem. Um, coming from Dubai, uh, where you have all everything all year round, because we get from all around the world. Now we're bound to seasons, which is a good thing in the one side, sure, because sure. you learn to be creative. But if you're spoiled and you can get everything <laughs> anytime, it makes a difference. And then I think also um, the students here uh, learn different. Remember, they're still the old school. Um, they they up and coming now in this country. We're talking about the ex-Soviet country and mm -hmm. everything associated with that. So it's up and coming. Um, they um, they're very set in their ways. They're not so curious. And mm -hmm. I think people like Mr. Calvin Kong um, opening the school is helping the Azerbaijani students um, together with everyone to you know to to improve this area. But it's fascinating, the culture, if you think all these recipes. But this is basically the scene in Azerbaijan. I think maybe I'll try the rusty nail. I don't in, think so. In, in, <laughs> I don't know that I will consume it, but I'd love to see if it imparts some yes. color and, and, and to the final sauce. Fascinating. 
<laughs> you know, we're, we're going to talk a lot uh, about some of the work that you do. Um, but a big part of our audience, Wanda, is is our students. And you you touched on it just a little bit. But I'd love for you to set the stage a little bit more. Take us all the way back to growing up in South Africa. And then, of course, you graduated from culinary school and became a pastry chef. And um, again, you talked a little bit about what what enticed you. But was cooking a big part of your family growing up? Was was there a tradition in your your family's kitchen and and then the question I always like to ask is, how is that tradition, if there was tradition, how does that stay with you and influence the cuisine that you create or have created today? Okay, thank you for the question. Um, my mom told me when I was eight years old, I insisted I want the chef's hat and a cookbook. <laughs> See, there you, go. Actually, there you go. <laughs> actually, today, yes, the cookbook. I've, it, it's more than 47 years old. Oh, my goodness. I'm still, yeah. it's, it's rough and plastic because it's, it's sort of falling apart. Falling apart, um, yeah. Is that I'm you? Still... Is that you on the cover? No, no. no this no. is the, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but it's still with me and it travels everywhere with me. And this Isn't is what I have something? from my... <laughs> so wow. that's where I started. Um, I was also into business um, because, like I said, I'm curious. I have a lot of interest. And um, so for... A, very long time I didn't follow it. It might be also because due to finances, I couldn't afford to go to a proper culinary school. Um, I didn't really study. I started almost to work immediately. And in that time, you, you could work immediately. And um, later in my life, I decided that I want to follow the culinary career. And I enrolled myself into evening classes. I had a very good, I was working a very long time for the company. And they were very tolerant with me. And they allowed me to go to evening classes, but Fridays I was working as an intern in a hotel. So they allowed me not to come to work on a Friday so that I could complete my internship um, for my chef course. And then they knew that I would leave um, because, you know, my passion wasn't that. Um, like I told you, I left the country and then I changed more into academics. But it really started when I was eight years old. Um, for traditional food, um, South Africa is not as colorful as, for example, um, and spices as Indian food. I learned to love Indian food in Dubai, um, especially Middle Eastern food. Um, and I really miss sometimes spices because there's also a lack of nice spices in this country. Mm -hmm. um, but it's not as colorful. And we like sugar, a lot of sugar with a lot of food. Um, sugar with meat, we do a babuti. And uh, maybe you're familiar with that, with, which is like a custard base. Um, um, uh, sweet meat. Um, also, um, it's not so creative than many other cultures I've learned with all my travels through the world. But um, as a tradition, my grandmother was had a German background. My father and obviously the rest of the family was Dutch. So I grew up with the Dutch tradition and the strip waffles and everything like that. And then my uh, grandmother was always making the kartoffelen, uh, potato <laughs> dish, and so that yeah. was a favorite dish. But for, that was the background. And I think I really developed my, my culinary background or my love for the spices when I moved overseas. When I moved abroad, um, it changed everything. Um, if you remember, South Africa is very on the bottom of the, the world. So, yeah, <laughs> so yeah. once you go to the Middle East, obviously you, you start to learn about all the different cultures and the different food. And that really opened up for me, um, you know, the different cultures. Yeah. And because yeah. it's obviously, yes. And, 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 and strokes your, your curiosity. I love that. Yes. Um, so then, so then moving forward then, um, it, it's quite, it's quite clear why you had this desire to become a chef. And, and my next question is kind of twofold. It's a little tougher um, <laughs> to, 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 to understand quality management and, 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 and control quality assurance. I think, I think people probably have a general idea of what that means, but I guess two parts, what does that mean to you in your field of work and what's involved in an MBA, you know, one of the highest levels of academic achievement in quality 
management, quality insurance. What I, I think I think p- listeners are going to be fascinated about another career path once once you tell us exactly what it is. <laughs> okay, sure. Um, thank you. Um, so, um, uh, for any students listening today, um, there's many ways that you can pursue your your um, passion for culinary. You, you you don't have to be um, um, cooking in a kitchen all the time. Um, one of this is the like you mentioned, the total quality management. Um, total quality management, to sum it up in one word very quickly, is continuous improvement. Continuous improvement in kitchens, in the way we teach, in the way we do everything around hospitality industry, especially the culinary industry. And it means uh, checking the whole time and basically improving the whole time. So when I decided on my topic for my MBA, um, I specifically looked at HAZAP, um, the, the food safety part, and I was investigating all the bakeries in the UAE and find out, you know, what is the criteria, how they look at quality, are they following it, which is different in this country, for example. UAE is mandatory and here in this country is up and coming. But that was really my passion. And I find a combination between my passion and also quality, because quality is also important for me. I believe that if we don't have quality in anything that we do, it's almost um, not value in it. Because even if it's something small we do, we should always do it with the highest quality. If it's teaching, if you're producing an item, if you um observing food safety, but the quality is really important in every step all the way. So this is a different um, career, but same because currently um, this is part of my job, daily job, is quality, quality insurance, continuous improvement in many ways. You know, it's it as I as I listen to your story and I think about um how you've pursued this uh this career and in, in, in measuring and continuous improvement. I'd, I'd love for you to speak just a little bit about, it's obvious that it's important to you, but how does this, I mean, you have a job, right? And then you come home, does this continuous improvement <laughs> impact your, your, your home life as well? Are you, are you, are you driving your husband crazy because you're looking for more continuous <laughs> improvement uh, in the home as well, but in a serious way, how does it, how does it impact you, uh, in 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 areas outside of work? I think not so much at home. I can um, because I think it's maybe the hours, um, not the working hours. As I'm currently doing my my uh, the doctoral degree, um, so I don't really have time to continue to improve <laughs> inside my my home environment. <laughs> However. I think where you can definitely see it is when I choose, when I go outside to eat outside, I'm very particular where I eat. I, I will not eat at a place um, if I don't think the food safety is there, if they don't follow um, the food safety, the, the everything about food. Um, I'm very particular on that. And I think that is because my knowledge about food safety, um, creating safe food, the environment, um, it's really standing out for me. Um, maybe for other people, when I go with a group and friends, they will not even notice it. But I will pick up the wrong board in the kitchen, the chopping board, uh, the 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 <laughs> glass cleaner I use for food, and I will not eat out. So I'm a very difficult eater in that sense. I don't eat everywhere. I will not so eat street food unless I'm really sure that they follow food safety rules. No, um, and that's and I'm and- for, that's fair and that's honest, right? I, yes. I I don't I don't know I don't know that you're the only person that that feel we have so much knowledge at our fingertips, right? We can we can use technology to do to to read reviews. Um yes. and not, not only on restaurants but hotels and and other exactly. businesses. You 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 really have to manage quality so that the perception to the consumer is going to buy your product is excellent. Yes, sir. it's just the world yes. we live in, right? Yeah. Yes. No, I agree on that, and also I think I think it becomes a part of your life. Um, you cannot separate it. Um, even if I tell you I don't really, I don't walk around in my home and say, "Can we improve this? Can we improve this?" <laughs> but it becomes a part of your life. And um, sure, if it's sure. not followed, um, it it creates stress in your life uh, because it's bothering you. You know, it's not correct. Uh, it's not improving. 
um, I think for all of us, uh, because also for any chef in the background is this is what you follow, um, especially in some places. So you it becomes part of your life and you cannot help it. But um, even when somebody invites you for dinner, I check very carefully how the food is prepared. <laughs> and it's okay to be unapologetic for that, right? It it it's uh yeah, no 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 that's a that's a it's a very important point. I, I I'd have to honestly admit that I I have some of those tendencies as well. However, I sometimes overlook those tendencies, right? I sometimes what I know, I wish I didn't know. Right? Uh, yes, that's because what I wanted to say. It's like you you know, if I come over to a friend's house and I see a roast on the counter um, you know, unrefrigerated and I come back 4 or 5 hours later to see if I can help and that roast is still there, I'm probably not it's having a, a roast that night. <laughs> yes. <laughs> you see, I've done it before, so I would just say no, unfortunately I don't eat it. I would just, you know, <laughs> try and eat something else. Yeah. But it is a problem. No. I don't know if it's a curse or a blessing. I'm not sure, but yes, it is a problem. No, no but it's a everyone. balance. It's a balance. Well, well yes. you, you mentioned the word stress and we'll get to that in just a moment, but I'm curious. I've always thought, particularly if one of my instructors decides that they would like to pursue additional education and, and myself included, I, I, I do recall when I was studying for my master's degree in education, I felt like I, I felt like a good student, but I also felt like a great employee. I felt like while I was learning, I was a really good instructor. I was a really, I was, I was sharing what I was learning with enthusiasm and excitement as I, as I share that with my team or, or students indirectly. So I'm just curious as the head of quality assurance um, in your current role and uh, studying for your PhD, do you find that there's a nice balance there? Are you, are you, are you an even better manager because you're learning alongside? Yes, I think um, I can agree on that. I think because um, part of my um, my job includes sometimes a guest lecturer. I do sometimes teaching also at, um, like I said before, in university, I was a full-time lecturer sometimes. Um, I do supervision for students, but um, as you as you progress with your own studies, um, actually the thing that I did manage was because I'm doing burnout and stress. The more I'm doing burnout and stress, the more I see myself in this whole thing. I can tell you exactly what stage I am. <laughs> so so except for yeah. what I, and I'm able to my, I able to to um, see other employees or maybe my colleagues when they reach certain stages. Um, I can see when, you know, when stress is getting to them, when it when it's reach a level that we should stop, which we should do something. So um, I think it gives you a far better background how to manage people in the sense of I understand people. So if somebody is difficult, um, I, I, I understand it. It's not coming from it's not me. It, it might be that the person is going through a lot of things. Maybe it's the, the work pressure, the a lot of things happening in their life. So I definitely, I think it makes me more tolerant, um, you know, to handle people and um, always try and understand people. Why do you react like this? And when I teach from time to time, I really feel that I can tell stories. I believe when you teach, you should tell stories instead yes, of just reading yes. through a presentation. If you tell stories to your students and they understand it's real life, they remember it. But if you just read through a presentation, um, they don't really remember anything. So with this experience and my current studies, I'm really able to tell them stories or examples. Um, so in all cases, it helps with leadership and management. When I stand in front of a class, when I um, try and supervise students from all over the world, because I literally have from all over the world and um, up to master's level, sometimes doctoral degree, um, it makes a difference, definitely, because you learn as you go. A hundred percent. And yes. and 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 do you find that including the students? I love the story part. I, I fully, fully, one hundred percent agree. So you become an educator. You're also a storyteller. Do you find that it's valuable to include the students, almost to flip the classroom? In other words, you know, have a student share their experience, uh, whether it's about dropping a rusty nail into a stock or 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 some other tradition. Do you find that that helps? the overall learning in the classroom? Yes, definitely. Um, I really believe in outcome-based learning. 
and student-centered learning. The student must be part of the class. It's the student's class and you just there to guide them and to gain the knowledge. Um, I'm definitely against um, where the teacher is doing the only work and just now and then a question. Um, what I need to say in this country, for example, um, they still follow a very traditional learning method. And um, the, the problem is when, when you teach in Azerbaijan, I don't speak Azerbaijan, I speak a little bit Azerbaijani, I can help myself in the market, I can help myself in a taxi. <laughs> but when you teach, I always have translator. Um, some students don't understand English. Um, that is still fine, but if you want to just to, to fight with somebody, by the time it's translated, you forgot the story what you're fighting about. So it's not. <laughs> <laughs> but this is the challenge here. But even with this challenge, I really believe that um, still the stories. I think I can see my passion when I tell it. Um, yeah, yeah. And the translators is normally very good in our our Kalani Institute. So they they already know the you know the story and then many of obviously of the staff members they expats as well so they speak english but yes um definitely it's uh, the student must be center uh, gone are the days where the teacher is important and the student is just listening and you're just reading or you do all the work the students need to be involved they, fully agree fully agree. this is how they do. yes and thank you for that thank you for that let's toss let's talk a little bit about not just stress management, but prioritizing stress management. I love that. Um, this it, it, It's a very super important and relevant topic, uh, especially for, for professionals in our industry, right? Um, but but I think it's great. It's a great conversation beyond our industry. Um, you wrote an article um, called Running on Empty, which which I saw on LinkedIn. Um, and it's what what I love is that it's, that particular article was, was like really straightforward, right? This this is this is how stress works. I never thought about stress. <laughs> quite honestly, Wanda, I never thought about stress in stages, right? Um, okay. So for our listeners, if if you could, if it's not stressful, to walk us through <laughs> no, it's fine. the 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 stages, not only the stages of stress at a high level. But how that how different factors can affect us on an individual level. That's what's really that's what's really important to me. And and maybe as a, a second part of that question, how does emotional intelligence come to play into the management, um, into stress management? So I will first explain to you the uh, very simple terms: the stress, uh, what is stress, the different levels of stress. And then I would uh, like to explain to you what I normally use to explain emotional intelligence to students for anybody to understand. So if we think about stress, um, we have good stress and we have harmful stress. We need good stress because think about young culinary students go to competition. They need stress to push them to higher levels. If you're trying to obtain a degree or you want really to get good marks somewhere or you want to achieve a award at work or you need some stress to push you, otherwise we will not move forward. You need that good stress. The problem is when stress becomes harmful and um, harmful stress could be divided into two different sections. We have the acute stress, which happens when, for example, you're in a, in a car accident or maybe um, something happened at work, you hurt yourself at work. It's a very sudden stress event. Um, uh, it can last, and the effects can last from one or three days to about four weeks, but it's a once-off event, a stressful event. It's not normally happening in your life, and suddenly it's there. Um, people, different stuff happen to people. But then we also have the chronic stress, which could be, um, it could happen through daily hassles, for example. You're sitting every day in traffic driving to, to work. Um, you get to work, your suppliers is not delivering. Um, every day it's the same problem. Every day you have to fight with people, where's my, my products for the kitchen? Um, maybe you send out emails, you don't get back responses. Um, people is not following your instructions. All of that is daily hassles that continue and contributing to chronic stress. Plus, um, now and then you have this acute stress factors happening. It doesn't have to be severe like a car accident, but it could be maybe if you 
um, something happened at work, um, not on a regular basis, but it, it, it's something that's sort of a shock. It causes a shock on your body. When we have a stress response, our brain is actually fascinating. And so we can also have another complete discussion about the brain and the works and how it's handling stress. But if you think inside your brain, there's a hypothalamus, which is secreting the primary stress hormone, um, cortisol. And that moves into your body and it starts causing a lot of harm inside your body. Um, but if it's only a once-off event, it will not happen because it's not continuous. It will recover and go back to normal. The problem is when we have acute stress and chronic stress, but we never recover from the stress. As soon as the one is finished, the next one is there. Then there's the morning traffic, then there's the boss, then there's the working conditions. Um, we end up to have cumulative stress, um, we don't really recover from this, and eventually this will lead to burnout. And this is where, um, if I tell you, I can see when my colleagues is reaching a certain stage, there's certain um, points that you can see that you can observe to see this person is moving to a burnout stage, and this is when somebody needs to intervene or maybe have a discussion, or um, I will just, I will speak to it just now about it. But this is basically the, the stress. And also remember, none of us is completely stress-free. Maybe you had a not a good childhood. Maybe your, your upbringing was really difficult. Um, maybe you have other family problems. Um, maybe you come out of uh, many countries, um, especially men come out of war zones. Um, they were fighting early, when they were younger in wars, um, and that still the stress is not dealt with after all these years. And you come already with the stress package to work in a kitchen, and now you have the daily stresses, the acute stresses. Everything is cumulative, and then eventually it leads to burnout. Because as we know, kitchens is not an easy environment for nobody. No, absolutely um, not. Yeah, it's a difficult environment. If if we said. And just to to jump in there, not to to interrupt. Super super important. Is is it? I'm I'm thinking about proactive thinking, right? Like not 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 necessarily Wanda, just for my students. I'm I'm thinking about myself. I'm thinking about you know my family, my children. But why is it essential? Let's just say for students to proactively think about this. Maybe not in the exact detail that you just brought up, but but how to prioritize stress? How to? Um, oh, I wrote down what you know this idea of of relieving if if you're cognizant of the fact that you're experiencing some chronic um stress how how important is it for our students to think proactively to get out of that cycle um particularly as it could impact their career trajectory right if if stress is changing their life impacting their performance what they're measured on how how important or or what what hints or clues or or suggestions do you have for students to manage this? I, I'll be I'll be perfectly honest that um, it probably gets categorized under the the topic of mental health, but stress management is really prevalent today for 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 individuals going to school or not going to school. It impacts everything their their timeliness, their submitting of their work, their 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 enjoyment, their capability to learn because their 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 mind is on something else. Again, loaded question there. I almost forgot what the question was. It's more about <laughs> you, you know why why is it important for students to proactively think about it and what can they do to proactively think about it and control it. Okay, so I, I thought about this question, and uh, once again, I can give you many options on this. But I think there's one thing that's really important if you think about a future career. Um, I think if there's one thing that we can teach students, maybe even from a school level, not necessarily only in culinary institutes or in universities, um, we need to teach them emotional intelligence. And the reason why emotional intelligence is very important, if you don't have emotional intelligence, which many HR directors see as more important than IQ, um, you will not be able to communicate properly. You will not be able to motivate your team, make sound decisions, because everything will be based on emotions. So I think if there's one thing that we should 
especially make sure they understand is emotional intelligence. Um, there's many other things that we can add to it, but if they want to manage it, if you find that um, maybe your environment is stressful or maybe even from school level, um, it's a stressful environment. I think the most important is to know yourself, um, understand your background, think about who are you, because stress can also be influenced by personality. Different personalities handle stress differently. So you need to know what is your personality. Um, we think about the big five personalities, but also I'm um, like myself is a type A personality. So I'm always busy. I will go on holidays and I will start cleaning the place where I stay <laughs> because this is my personality. But you need to understand who are you. This is point number one. Um, the second one is um, we need to concentrate on our health. It's very easy to say. I've just interviewed a few chefs for my, my final study, and most of them has problems with their, their health by not eating properly, skipping meals. Um, it's almost like it's not important, but one chef told me that it's almost like you have a motor vehicle, you expect it to, to go, but you don't put petrol in it. You don't put oil in it. And then you're very surprised when it stopped working. And this is how we sometimes treat our body. We need to think what we eat. I understand coming from the background that sometimes there's no time to eat. And I know for myself, it's literally like this. But at least when we eat something, we need to think about the nutrition. What are we putting in our mouth? What are we swallowing down? Um, they, I'm also doing some brain research studies on what is healthy for your brain, what can reduce stress. Um, one thing that I recently was doing a study on is like, for example, dark chocolate. Dark chocolate, if you have a little bit of dark chocolate, um, it, it helps in the formation um, of dopamine, which is a natural um, stress reducer um, in your body. It will help you to reduce stress. And there's many other examples, for example, um, if you have in the morning when you wake up a glass of water before you drink coffee, tea, anything, your brain is hydrated after the night's rest. It needs some liquid. And the only liquid that can reach immediately is water, pure, clean water. And not purified water, just normal, good water. Um, also, um, I used to tell students, for example, um, a simple thing you can do in the kitchen or even at home, take an orange, a citrus fruit, and enjoy eating it. Smell it. Smell the orange. And break it open and listen to the sound. When you put it in your mouth, get a taste, the bitter, the sweet, whatever the result is. Listen when you eat it, the crunch. Only that enjoyment of eating that orange will help you to reduce your stress levels. And it's very simple. You can do it any place um, for a few seconds. Look what you eat and listen. Use all your senses. It helps you to reduce stress, for example. Um, also, um, I think what, what they can do is um, for yourself or maybe in culinary schools, we need to improve the cognitive ability of students. And what does it mean? It means that students need to learn how to solve complex problems, how to critical think about stuff, how to be creative about stuff. And what I used to do when I was teaching culinary a long time ago, I used to tell my students when they were looking for ingredients missing, I said, think, uh, think of something else. You need to learn, teach them how to think, how to solve problems. Uh, not only say, I don't know. They were never allowed to tell in my class, I don't know. They need to come up with a solution <laughs> because we need to teach them to use the cognitive ability. And then obviously small things like time management, which is very important. And I think if you're working in the kitchen, they're going to work in the kitchen. They're going to be managers. And obviously management and leadership skills, we should really teach them that because I think for a long time it was not brought in in culinary schools but also the sense of belonging. There's many people around the world, chefs, they're very far away from their, their homes, from their countries. They work all around the world. They're very lonely. Their only family is the kitchen family. And it's very important that the organization try to, to include, you know, give the sense of belonging to them. And there's many other ways that we can do it through meditation, through 
uh, different ways. But I think a few simple things like this, um, it can really help you. You need to care for yourself. Don't be your worst enemy. Think what you're doing. If you didn't have a break for eight hours, you just keep working. Maybe just take a quick walk. Take a few minutes break. Um, uh, power naps, I believe in power naps. If I have to work at night, I sleep on the couch for 10 minutes and I feel like new when I wake up. Um, you need to care for yourself. It's I, really I, important. Did you take a nap before we talked? Yes, I did. You did. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so there, <laughs> so there, there is so much there. That was, the, let me, I, I want to summarize a little bit. I was going to ask <laughs> about some signs, right, that we've, that 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 indicate that we've entered that zone but i think you you sort of answer that i'm gonna i'm gonna run into gonna go into a culture um question here in a minute but i i want to make sure that i got the these these five i think you had five points that are really poignant know who you are health i i love the you know not only eating well but enjoying the way you eat i love that um critical thinking is is critical, um, uh, pun intended. <laughs> it it is it is for and I'll and I'll use a pragmatic example, right? For our online students, when they prepare a dish uh, or a technique that we've asked them to, and they upload photos, um, the photos are certainly incredibly informative, and they help our instructors gauge whether or not students are comprehending you know, the technique, but what gives us the most comfort and insight um, into whether or not learning is taking place is their cognitive narrative. If, if they can talk about what they're doing, it, 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 it demonstrates critical thinking and, and we, and we have the ability to, uh, um, to assess them in a, in a very positive way. So I love that. Um, time management, we could all do better with that. Um, the fifth bullet was really interesting to me. This, you know, leadership slash uh, skills slash a sense of belonging. That, that that's another podcast in itself, right there. I think you said something about being away from home, and then the the kitchen becomes your home. Um, particularly for ground students who may travel from, you know, the East Coast or from abroad. Uh, to to come to school with us here at Escoffier, this that's that's a very I might even move that to the top, right? That's that's really Wanda. That is really really important. Um, so as with that as a backdrop, in the work that you've done, you've also talked about how leaders and managers today can play, how you and I can play a significant role in creating a culture. We can talk all we want, but how do we create a culture that prioritizes mental health? And and I'd love for you to speak a little bit about, you, you know, what soft skills can we prioritize? What what are some simple steps that 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 managers, instructors, can take to to cultivate, um, um, you know, and prioritize mental health, and and then. The, the toughest part of this, this is a question that I, I didn't tell you I was going to ask, but I'm I'm fascinated by the conversations around generations, you know, um, traditionalists, baby boomers, Gen X, millennials, alpha, uh, Gen Z, so on and so forth. Everything that you share with us do you believe that it changes from generation to generation to generation, the way that we're able to cope with stress, the way that we will listen to advice on how to prioritize stress? Um, I have my own thoughts <laughs> on that with, <laughs> with children that drop into almost all of those buckets. But uh, again, massive question there. Um, I think more than anything, if we can talk about how to develop that culture that prioritizes mental health and then maybe how it differs from, you know, generation to generation. Thank you for the two questions. Um, for um, I will explain to you just now the difference and what I've experienced is particularly in this country and, uh, you know, how it's fitting in in your question. 
Um, what I want to um, um, explain to you is that uh, when we, um, if you talk about culture in a kitchen and creating it, I've mentioned to you before emotion and intelligence. Um, what I even do in trainings for restaurant staff, for kitchen staff, when we talk about them, try to improve the culture, the, the stress management, the mental health. I think the following example is the simplest for everybody to understand. So if you think about a beggar, a person walking in the street, um, looking for food, he will go to a dustbin, he will open the dustbin, he will find maybe a box of food, maybe somebody throw away. Um, he will look at the box, he will pick the food that's still edible, what he thinks are still nutritional value, and the ones that is not any longer valuable or not possible to eat, he will throw away. It's the same with emotional intelligence. We cannot help um, that people maybe had a very bad conversation with us, um, don't speak in the proper way, is insensitive, no empathy. Um, maybe they didn't have the training. Maybe their background is, is very difficult. But we can choose how to react to people like this. Um, the same with the beggar. You pick out the words what this person is saying that might help you to improve or might be beneficial for you. And why are you taking the rest? Throw it away. Take it from words coming. You only use the words if maybe the person mentioned you never listen. And maybe that was valuable because maybe you need to improve your listening skills. But why are you listening to anything else which is not really related to you, but rather based on this person's background or whatever the reason was why they acted like this? And this is the same in kitchens. We should not. Um, we should teach staff because in kitchens, in the hospitality industry, emotions can run very high for different reasons. Maybe lack of training. Um, they may be trained as managers, but never learn to be leadership. Um, maybe they've never had any training related to that, especially if you look at all the culinary schools. I now know they're bringing it in a little bit more, but many schools are only teaching skills, but they never teach um, chefs how to be a leader, how to motivate your team. And I think also a very important um, aspect is cultural difference. Um, we might look the same. If I cut you open, we will look exactly the same. But we come from different backgrounds. And to answer your question about generations, um, I want to slightly shift it rather to the background, um, not about age only, but also about the culture. Um, where I'm currently staying has a Soviet background. They come with this mindset and the background um, where many of them was taught when they were younger not to think. They, they, they taught in schools, you cannot think, you should not think. You should copy and paste. You should study this and write this in the exam. So if you ask me about the differences, not only in the generations, definitely you find the old school, if you think about the Scoffier and all the, the early uh, gay chefs, um, they had a very military style. Um, and today, some chefs is more, they're more liberate, um, they, they're more open, they have more experience in management. But you could, should never forget the background of the person because if they come from this environment, their mindset is very, very rigid. Um, they follow this, doesn't matter the age, because their parents are following it. I was asking last year in the university, um, if we go digital, if I put everything online, will it be fine with you? The students told me, yes, but we still want the paper printout because our fathers believe <laughs> that you should have background. We don't trust the computer. So you That's understand that the mindset, yeah. yeah, the mindset. Um, it's yes, definitely the age, the different uh, groups as uh, they they they're improving slightly, but maybe um, they're dropping something else. Maybe the the skill set. I think the difference will be um, the older chefs is more particular about skill set, and the younger chefs is more related to technology. Yes. So yes. technology yes. starts to take a role, which we're going to discuss a little bit later. But I think maybe a skill set is not any longer the most important. Um, it might be that the younger chef starts to a little bit water down on this. Um, but definitely we need to think about culture. Also culture, um, as you know, many kitchens around the world has many cultures inside. 
and um, you will think, no, not all, all countries. But I've seen all over the world while I was traveling, you can easily find five, six, seven, eight, nine different nationalities in one kitchen. If you as a manager are not trained as a head of the kitchen or a executive chef, you've never been trained to handle cultural differences, how are you going to motivate your team? You don't understand collective culture. You don't understand individualistic culture. You're going to struggle. Some is going to listen to you and some is not going to listen to you. Um, so I really believe that culture with emotional intelligence is one of the most important understandings that we need to have to be able to lead the team successfully. And to deal also then, if you have this, you'll be able to, to manage the mental health because all of this is related, if you think about it, it's coming back to mental health, creating more stress, uh, maybe then followed by anxiety and depression. So so interesting, as you were speaking, I was, <clears throat> again, thinking of a pragmatic example. My, my parents, immigrants, same way, um, math was so important to them. Um, and, and it was all about memorization. It was it was and and, we, and and as children, my sister and I didn't ask questions. We just memorized what they asked us to memorize to this day. And and I and with my four children, it's been different. It's interesting. You know, when I when I challenge them on nine times nine and eight times eight and seven times eight, they 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 pose questions <laughs> back. Why? Why? Why do you care yes. what eight, eight times eight is? Yes, <laughs> um, and 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 it and it's a difficult response, right? Um, I want them in a weird sort of way to sort of memorize the way, the way I memorized, right? And and have never forgotten. They need more clarity. Young people today yes. need to understand, you know, what the what the significance of their answer is. <laughs> it's I always yes. use the example, Wanda, of, of, um, and it and it, it's kind of a cliche that. When when you look at a, a group of middle school students in a classroom and the teacher asks a question, oftentimes all the hands go up, especially the boys. They may or may not the, know the answers. They, they probably don't know the answer, but they self-esteem does not come into play. They don't they, they yes, just sir. want to be noticed. Right. But for adult learners like like we have here in 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 college. Right. Um, boy, self-esteem really comes into play, doesn't it? It, it. They may know the answer. They may think they know the answer, but they're they don't have the confidence to give the answer. Does does that cause stress? Right? I'm you, you know metaphorically. Does that cause stress as well? Um, really, really, really interesting. I I want to. I kind of want to roll that into what you're studying, right? Um, we, we alluded at the top of the show that you're studying um, creating lean cultures in the back uh, back of the house operations. Um, can we start right there and and define what a lean culture is or is supposed to be? <laughs> okay. Um, thank you for the question. Um so because of my total quality management background, um, I started to be interested in Lean Six Sigma, um, which is basically, in a very short version, explained um, creating lean, going leaner, uh, shaving off everything that can cause additional costs, um, wasting time, uh, extra motion, Anything that you can improve by making it lean and narrower, less time. And I started to be fascinated because um, Lean Six Sigma was originally implemented in manufacturing. Um, if you think uh, many, many years ago back, um, the Toyota um, car, Ford actually, they started in their factory to produce black motor vehicles, only black. They were streamlining the colors to only one color. <laughs> and so obviously, there was many people in between, uh, Deming, uh, many other people. But then I was interested in, the, by the time I started with this, um, my PhD, um, not so many people used Lean Six Sigma in kitchens. I know Starwood Group and Marriott Hotel Group, um, they were following the Lean Six Sigma principles. Um, but many people saying that it was more for manufacturing. However, uh, if you think about it, um, Lean Six Sigma in kitchens is very relevant. Um, 
in kitchens, we use food to produce, and in manufacturing, we use metal, correct? It's only the ingredient that is different that we use. So the principles of Lean Six Sigma can be applied in kitchens, meaning less wastage. Um, one that's really outstanding for me is maybe the skills that we sometimes miss of people because we don't take care to find out what staff can really do. Um, we don't pay attention to the CVs. Sometimes we hire a person from outside to maybe demonstrate sugar artwork, for example, but we have a person inside that's already qualified to do it that maybe is very good in it. So um, even that wastage of talent, skills that we're not aware of, it's also part of Six Sigma or Lean Six Sigma. But mostly it's based on um, product wastage, um, motion wastage to have a storeroom in that side, but we only working on this side um, and going as uh, lean as possible. So I will tell you a story um, about many years ago. I was working in a food production company and we were supplying food outlets with daily sandwiches, salads, uh, products like this. And I was also the continuous quality manager at that time. And I noticed one day when I was standing in the vegetable fruit area where they receive it, that we received um, vacuum packed um, lettuce packages, um, mixed lettuce, that um, they open, they break the seal and they put it in a GM container and in the next day they will use it. But the price of this packet, because it was specially packed vacuum sealed, was much higher than if you just buy the lettuce and you rinse it because we did have a rinsing station. Um, to cut a short story, long story short, the, the end result was in about three months, a saving of $30,000 by only um, changing, buying the, the product, not the vacuum pack product, make the mix ourselves and serve it as part of the salad. Instead of using the vacuum pack, uh, packet lettuce, which doesn't have any purpose because they open it as soon as it arrives on the premises. So this is what Lean is about, to look at opportunities, not only in cost saving, but less wastage. Maybe we have a very long process for something. We can cut out a few steps. It saves time. It's less um, um, tired for maybe the person creating it. It can be a cost saving. Um, we need to think all the time how we can go leaner, less time. And this is what's happening in the kitchen. But this is an example I thought would give you a very good idea how we can think about going leaner. No, it's absolutely fascinating. I'm curious, one question uh, on that one before we go into Industry 4.0. Um, do you find in your experience with Lean Six Sigma that it's an individual approach to this sort of philosophy or a team approach or both? Um, I would say, the, um, okay, firstly, it's a team approach, but you must have management support. Okay. If you only have the lower level, uh, management must buy the idea, understand the process of going lean, implementing lean principles, and then you can follow it through as a team effort. And um, I always tell people, if we implement it, that you will be surprised what you find from cleaners. They normally have the most information. Yes, yes. <laughs> that is yes, the people yes. that you should get involved in programs like this. They will tell you exactly where the wastage is and where it's taking a long time to do anything. They know everything. I love it. I love it. I read. I read that part of your research study includes um, how robotics will affect the mental health of chefs in in food production facilities. Um, and, and and this is overall part of this concept of industry 4.0. So th this this is possibly a whole nother podcast again, but uh, at a high level, could you talk a little bit about industry 4.0 and are, are we in that now? Are we in industry 4.0 today? Um, my opinion is yes and no. And I will tell you why. Because Industry 4.0 is for a number of years already with the industry, different industries, where we are implementing Internet of Things, AI, robotics, latest technology to improve manufacturing. And most people have the fear of it will take my job. 
um, I will lose my job. Everything will be um, automated and um, it will change. However, if you look at Japan, they already moved to Industry 5.0, um, where instead of we think that robotics will take our jobs, we rather see um, technology, automation um, as helping us. It, it becomes our help as our assistant. And we work together as a team um, to create the product. Um, so this is the shift. Um, some countries are still in 4.0, but definitely it's changing. The more people is experiencing robotics, and the food industry was um, up to recently not so familiar with robotics, but it's rapidly changing. And if you look at the figures of um, um, robotics, um, that you can see that there will be a, a very high increase, especially after COVID, because as you know, there was a lot of staff shortage, many students, many people left mm -hmm. the industry and robotics um, went up, not because they're losing their jobs, but people start to realize we can implement it and use it in an effective way. What I really believe is that it will take the job away. If you think about a chef maybe um, uh, working in an environment where there's a lot of fried chicken, um, a lot of dangerous work, the whole time deep frying of chicken, um, it will remove that dangerous job and it will give the chef the opportunity to rather create because creativity, we can program robots on human profiles. We can teach them how to think based on our profiles, but they will they will never have that human element, um, which we can ex can't explain to someone. Um, we program a robot, but you know, you, you can find sometimes a taste, you can create something that you cannot explain. And mm -hmm. we rather use the talent um, to be more creative, to produce things like that. And we remove the repetitive, dangerous jobs. And this is the way how I think um, it's going to move forward. Um, what I'm interested in in this study is to see, um, as we say that chefs is already stressed uh, based on many things, uh, working conditions, um, sometimes poor salary, um, bad management. But is robotics going to improve the mental health, making it less stressful for chefs? Um, than just a normal kitchen without any robotics. And this is currently what I'm investigating and collecting data. Wanda, since we're on the on the topic of robotics, I'd be remiss if I didn't segue yeah. into AI and chat GPT. I'm um I'm not questioning whether we we should use it or not. Um I'm I'm interested in your perspective on how to leverage it and to to, to the best of our ability. I think um, what you rightly say in the beginning that we should utilize everything, correct? Um, we should not um, avoid it because it's a new development. If you think about when we got a mobile phones, when the computer was implemented, everybody said it would not work um, and look where we are today. So my view on chat GPT or maybe any AI facility creating work is the following. Um, I've done several tests, um, um, a little bit pilot studies on different uh, scenarios. Um, and I really believe that we need to teach the student how to use it in the correct way. So what does I mean? What is the meaning of this? It means that um, students will, do, will use it because like me, they're also curious. They learn from their friends, they see it on, on social media and definitely they will use it. But if we teach them to use it the right way as a guide, okay, and then add your creativity, your perspective to it, we can use it in a positive way. So instead of telling them you cannot use it, um, we need to teach them in the right way. I've done recently a study on Christmas menus, and I was explaining to the students in our school, and I said, so if you're going to create a Christmas dinner or a lunch menu for different nationalities, you need to sit down and think about the nationality, what is important, or you can use chat GPT. What is the, the, the lunch menu for South Africans? What is the lunch menu for Canadians? What is the lunch menu for German people? You get the idea what is popular for Christmas, and then the creativity will come in by your creation of the recipe, correct? You need to come up with the taste, the flavor, the recipe to make it special. But it will save time instead of doing research. What does South Africans eat? What does Germans have for lunch for Christmas? 
it will tell you that. But mm -hmm. you need to build in the creativity and do the research on the, the flavors, how you're going to build your personality in it. But I think for a time-saving tool, it's very helpful in that sense. Um, also, um, what I've done a study is, um, because many universities um, sometimes complain that students use it, um, it's very simple to find out how they use it. If you ask ChatGPT that you create a document, it will tell you, yes, I've created the document, or no, I didn't create a document. But I really believe we should utilize it. But teach the students to use it as a calculator, um, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. in a positive way. Um, but they should also know how to do it by themselves. I was hoping you'd say that. <laughs> <laughs> I, you know, we we've been chatting for for so long, and I I just realized, um, you know, time time just flies when you're having fun, and it's getting late into the evening. But I, if 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 you can indulge me, I I I do. I have one really important final question. Um, but before I get there, I was hoping you could share just from your perspective, your experience, your life experiences, any words of wisdom on how to better or continue to better prepare culinary students, those interested in our craft, to enter this craft in this ever-changing world that we're in, which includes stress management and and technology at the highest level and and financial challenges and so on and so forth any words of wisdom of of how a student can best prepare themselves for this industry um what well, in a recent study i was doing for this government um i was telling them that we we teach the students the skills um, with a little bit background about management um, and maybe um, how to uh, um, apply for um, uh, job applications, a little bit background on that, but we're not really preparing them for entrepreneurship. Um, we're teaching them a skill. Many of them is going to open maybe their own restaurant or going trying to attempt to open their own restaurant, but we never taught them how to read a basic financial statement, how to hire the correct candidate for the position, what is the legalization in your country uh, uh, um, uh, referring to the opening a business? What documents is required? Um, how do you make a loan at a bank if you don't have the money? That is skills, I think, for the very um, entry level that I think sometimes is lacking. They can, they're, they're very good in the skill craft, but they open a business and then they fail because they don't have the background of this important um, business management skills. And the second thing is um, preparing them for technology. Um, definitely, um, we should stay with the classic skills because this is why we chefs, correct? This is why um, they come to culinary school. But like I've mentioned before, um, once they know the skills to do it by hand, there is technology that can help you to save time, to manage your time better, um, that can help you in kitchens. But if you don't understand the classic method, um, it's more difficult to, to um, identify problems with technology, correct? Mm -hmm. If, if mm -hmm. you have a rice cooker, for example, doing a few thousand kg at one time, if you don't understand the basics, um, the, the identification of problems become, you only understand AI. So I think, I guess what I'm saying is that the teaching of classic skills is very important. But at the same time, we need to expose students to the latest technology. Um, if they're going to travel, um, if they're going to work in different countries in the world, every country is different. If I think, for instance, the UAE, the technology is completely different in this country. So what if I send my student out and he's going to work in that country and he doesn't understand technology? He's never seen any AI technology in kitchens. He doesn't understand it. So... Even if it's not always possible to physically let them use in, in your environment, but you must make them aware of what is happening in the world, which is changing every day. And as we speak, technology is changing. At, absolutely, we need to it stay, is. Yeah, we need to stay ahead of what's happening and inform students. Also, um, I believe in sometimes simulations um, where they can experience a new environment, even business and simulation, entrepreneurial simulation. Or maybe an environment uh, in a kitchen environment is completely different. 
so that I can experience a little bit of the real environment in this way. Um, I think this is important to prepare them for the future. Really well said. Thank, thank you for that. Thank you for that. So, Wanda, the the name of our podcast of our chat is the ultimate dish. Oftentimes, the toughest question that we ask, and that is, what is the ultimate dish in your mind? Um, I think the um, the ultimate dish. This is a difficult question. <laughs> Right? <laughs> right because, <laughs> for my PhD um, candidate. Yeah. For my PhD candidate. I'm not very big on food. I, I like the <laughs> thing as well. But I think um I, I really think um for myself, um if I don't think food related, um I do uh, do like a lot of seafood, but I think something chocolate related maybe. Um because um to explain to you my answer is when I eat, unfortunately, I always keep in mind, is it helpful for my brain? Will it benefit my brain? Will it contribute to brain function? <laughs> Especially if you do PhD. <laughs> so it's really a difficult question because I eat according to my brain at this stage. That's a good answer, though. And, and that's <laughs> your answer, right? So for you, the ultimate dish, the food you put in your body has to have some sort of reaction. And for you, it's 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 thinking it's 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 so perhaps it is chocolate or a glass of port before you go to bed at night right exactly <laughs> <laughs> wanda thank you so much for taking we we've taken way too much of your time um we so appreciate your knowledge and and i'm sure that there's a there's a part 2 out there somewhere because there's so much left to talk about congratulations on on all of these uh success and and I hope you have a, a beautiful holiday season. Okay, thank you. And the same to you as well as Noel. I hope you have a wonderful season. And um, hopefully see you again next year sometime. Thank you for listening to the Ultimate Dish Podcast brought to you by Auguste Escoffier School of Culinary Arts. Visit escoffier.edu forward slash podcast where you'll find any materials mentioned during the podcast, including notes, links, and other resources. You can also browse other episodes and subscribe.